welcome to another episode of Data Skeptic and our ongoing series, although we're going to deviate from this a little bit today, in natural language processing. I'm not sure that's actually going to come up, but in this conversation with Rohan Kumar that I had at the Microsoft Build conference just a few weeks ago, we definitely get data heavy. We talk about the cloud, data infrastructure, serverless computing, edge computing, serverless databases even, if you can believe that, and just have a rather, I guess you might say, low-level discussion, or at least low-level from the NLP perspective. What sort of cloud infrastructure is going to be available in the future, and how are we going to power our applications? I myself am all in on serverless. It's tremendous. But enough about me. Let's get into the conversation. My name is uh, Rohan Kumar, and uh, I'm the Corporate Vice President uh, Engineering for the Azure Data Team at Microsoft. So that's the team that's responsible for all our data platform products, you know, think SQL Server and all the data services that we have in the cloud, uh, for relational databases, open source databases, you know, NoSQL, analytic services, etc. So what are some of the, um, I'm, we're going to get to announcements, of course, but I'm just curious for users who maybe haven't dabbled in Azure yet or are, you know, in er- other areas that maybe application developers want to know what the data opportunities are, what is the entire data ecosystem? Where are some good starting points? When, when I sort of talk to, you know, broad developers, I mean, there's just such a huge amount of focus around machine learning and AI and all the new scenarios that enables, and which is fantastic. And I mean, we see this, you know, especially... Uh, you know, we've been speaking about this whole notion of application uh, paradigm, you know, shifting around the intelligent cloud and the intelligent edge, where you have these distributed applications that get built, uh, you know, uh, where there's a huge volume of data that actually is stored on the edge devices. In fact, you know, there are analyst reports that say that upwards of 70% of all the data that's produced is going to be on these, you know, billions of edge devices that mm. are there. And then there's a whole new class of distributed applications that are getting built, where a solution sort of spans edge, you know, private clouds, what's there in the public cloud. And then uh, there's a lot of machine learning and AI that happens on these edge devices as well. So you train your models in the cloud using the you know, compute power, and you deploy them on these edge devices to do inferencing and such. Now, if you step back for a second, I mean, these are all amazing new scenarios, right, you know, that are being produced to serve our customers. But the foundation to get right is the data platform, Mm -hmm. is the modern data state. And if you don't invest in having the right foundation, then almost everything else is going to be tricky, you know, to get right. As our enterprise customers, as an example, as they're thinking of building out, you know, new business scenarios, uh, looking for operational efficiencies, et cetera, by using uh, uh, machine learning and AI to drive those processes. The discussions we always have is how do we build out the data state that essentially enables you to do that in the most efficient and, and, and the most productive way. You start with having a foundationally great investment in your data platform. So uh, in terms of the announcements at this conference, what were some of the highlights from your perspective? You know, if I had to sort of step back and really pick out, you know, the big ones and I'll sort of, you know, talk about, you know, the uh, various groupings. Mm -hmm. You know, the first one is just uh, uh, around the work we've done to make our relational databases in the cloud very highly scalable and performant. This sort of goes back to the discussion we were just having, right? There's there's a whole uh, set of applications uh, and most of the applications these days rely on multiple data stores. You know, they rely on relational databases, NoSQL databases, etc. You know, as the data volumes grow, there's expectations just around, you know, performance and scalability. Mm-hmm. And today, if you take a look at the normal challenges that developers run into is, you know, data is unpredictable, right? Like the volume of data mm-hmm. and then, and but we know it's sort of growing at a very rapid clip. Uh, so how do you go handle that? And, you know, without making your solution very complicated and expensive, and so the big thing that we're excited about is this whole this technology called Hyperscale for relational databases that we announced for uh, uh, both uh, Azure SQL Database and uh, Postgres SQL. And this is going to come in the future to our MySQL offering as well. So for all our databases, mm-hmm. you know, proprietary and open source, there's two uh, big bets we've made. One is scaling out the storage itself. So imagine where you never have to think about, you know, how big is my relational database ever going to get, right? It's, it's the system essentially scales with your needs. And uh, it's a, it landed up being a complete redesign at the storage engine layer of uh, the core SQL engine and that became a part of Azure SQL database. Theoretically, there's no limit to the size of the database, but we've tested up to 100 terabytes. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, with things like restore times for these databases being in minutes. Just for comparison, you know, today on-premises when our customers do restores of these large databases, they could take days up to weeks. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, so there's lots of key innovation that went into it. The other part is, you know, for all your read workloads, you can instantly scale out, 
right? So you can create multiple compute nodes that essentially handle a lot of the read-only workload, which is, you know, it usually lands up dominating in a lot of these uh, applications. And then things like backups, et cetera, like for these large databases are instantaneous, uh -huh. right? So there's a lot of, and, and this project has been in the making for the last three years, right? So we made that generally available. So super excited about that. With Postgres, you know, we recently acquired this company called Citus Data. This was back in January. We announced the acquisition. And, you know, within four months of the acquisition, we were able to release uh, the core Citus technology, which essentially uh, supports scaling out at the compute layer for the Postgres database, uh, which is really fantastic. In fact, this is one of the things that really excited us about Citus. I mean, it's, you know, there's a super strong team. Uh, they've built a great product. And, you know, the value system matches really well with, you know, where, how we're thinking in Azure all up and, you know, with an Azure data about, you know, con you know participating with the open source community. And we're big believers in Postgres. We believe it's, it's, it's going to be one of the databases, especially the, on the open source side, that's going to take off in a big way. So that uh, hyperscale for Postgres based on the Citus technology is available now in public preview for our customers. So that's that's a big one, you know, just all up, I'm excited about. Uh, the other thing is we've uh, released the serverless option for uh, Azure SQL database and preview. So think about customers who are dealing with workloads that are very intermittent, where, you know, being able to provision capacity upfront leads to a lot of inefficiencies and lots of complexities, mm -hmm. right? So we want developers just focused on their business logic. The billing model is very, very uh, tailored to these sort of workloads to ensure that the cost remains very low. Mm -hmm. So effectively think about it. You just come and issue a query, you run your workload, and the system essentially decides how much of CPU and how much of memory, ex all the other resources that are needed, and then based on that, optimizes it to run your workload, and then you basically pay per second. If you think about these intermittent workloads, right, where you're not running them all the time, it lands up being a very cost-effective model. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, we've seen a lot of excitement around that. The third thing, you know, and, and, and these are all important announcements, is uh, getting our core SQL database to the edge devices. So think ARM processors. Uh -huh. Again, there the team has done a lot of good work in uh, ensuring that the core value proposition of SQL Server, including the built-in machine learning, AI, time series element, you know, works on these edge devices because they're usually not server class machines, right? A lot of them have a very limited amount of compute power. You know, how do you sort of uh, leverage that, you know, low amount of compute power while maintaining the value that you get of the core SQL engine? And it's interesting when you see now with what we have on the edge with Azure SQL Database Edge, uh, you know, what we support with SQL in the private cloud and the hybrid environments and the public cloud, I actually think we have a very fantastic story in Azure all up for these intelligent cloud, intelligent edge applications. So that's all on, in, on, on the you know, core uh, operational databases side. On, on the analytics, a couple of good announcements or just exciting ones. The first one essentially is we've bought uh, native support for Apache Spark on Cosmos DB. So Cosmos DB you know, just is our flagship service that supports multi-model databases, you know, highly scaled out. You know, it supports up to petabytes of data. You know, we, one of the asks that we kept getting from our customers is, look, I want to do real-time operational analytics. I don't want to move data outside of Cosmos mm -hmm. DB. How do you get, you know, compute engines like Spark very close to it? And the team has done a really good job of not just supporting the Spark API, but inherently understanding how the data is distributed and having the compute infrastructure be co-located with the data, if you think about it on the same node, so that the Spark queries can gain a lot of efficiency by running very, very close to the data. So super excited about that. We're seeing a ton of traction uh, the other thing was we now support Jupyter Notebooks on all APIs on Cosmos DB. So Jupyter Notebooks is, is I'm sure your listeners are aware, of becoming super popular mm -hmm. with a lot of the developer community, right? Things become so simple. You're dev and test. You can just you know, start typing code and start seeing results right in the same frame. Now that works with you know, all the APIs that we support in Cosmos DB. So that's actually super exciting. On the warehousing side and you know, the modern data warehouse pipeline that we talk about, which is you know, how the core enterprise data warehouses and companies are getting disrupted, where, you know, if you had something like a Teradata or an Ateezer, et cetera, and, you know, how do you modernize that to do more predictive analytics in, with machine learning and AI? Uh, one of the biggest problems we see data engineers face is they have to write a lot of complicated scripts to build out these pipelines. So we've been working on this thing called uh, Data Flows in Azure Data Factory. It's a completely visual experience. So you don't have to write, it's like a no-code experience that we built for data engineers where, you know, you, you, you have a, a UI tool where you actually sort of pick the data sources, you know, do the transformations all through the UI. Like you could say, join this table with this mm -hmm. one on this column, project this, right? And it's very intuitive. Underneath the covers, the service, it's a serverless service to do ETL and ELT, that generates the Spark code that we run in, in uh, Databricks Spark mm. for efficient execution, right? So 
the the value for this is if you look at it from most of the data engineers they're again focusing on the on building out the pipeline the the, the declarative elements of it versus okay how do i implement this in spark to get it right mm-hmm. right so it significantly reduces the burden and i actually think this is going to be a game changer uh, and and again it's been one of the fastest adopted features of any uh, service that i've seen i mean there's just a lot of excitement around it then the team is does not resting there they're taking the next step around making wrangling of data so imagine once you've landed the data you look at the data and you say well it's not really in the structure that i want it to be so i want to make some changes mm-hmm. So the feature that the teams worked on is again it'll be a visual experience where you have let's say a tabular form where you have certain cells filled out now you go change the data in one of them backing that is a machine learning model that looks at what you did and that change can be applied to the entire column in that data set so mm-hmm. imagine you went and changed you know particular format in the address and said well there should be two commas in between the mm-hmm. system recognizes learns based on what the user did and then applies it and again this is super powerful we work we working very closely with microsoft research mm-hmm. to build out wrangling because that again as we see as a pretty hard problem yeah thanks to this week's sponsor the great courses plus we all deserve to be able to further our knowledge and keep learning so go on indulge yourself that's right kick off your shoes put your feet up lean back and just enjoy the great courses plus There are professors from the best universities in the world like Harvard, Yale, and Stanford, experts from National Geographic and the Smithsonian. This is college-level learning without the loans or the pressure of homework. And the Great Courses Plus makes it possible to learn whichever way works best for you. Watch or listen to lectures anytime on the go or at home. Listeners might be interested in checking out mathematical decision making, predictive models and optimization. If you're one of the listeners who's more on the business side or sort of non-technical but enjoys the show, absolutely this is the course for you. Technical people make sure you have these skills as well. Maybe you're good at programming but you don't know anything about personal financing and retirement. This series is incredibly insightful and surprising uses for simple math to address critical decision making that we all face. Unlock a world of knowledge right now with the Great Courses Plus. You can start a free trial by visiting thegreatcoursesplus.com/data. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com/data. Well, a lot of interesting ones to go back and follow up on. The one that's got me maybe the most curious is the serverless database right. functionality. Right. Databases were one of the last things I thought I'd have the opportunity to use serverless right. because I've got that concern about response time. That's right. What should my expectations be if I want to explore it? And that's a it's a, it's a fair point, right? It's when I mean, you obviously when you have fully provisioned resources, the guarantees that you have around response times, you know, land up being a lot more predictable. Mm-hmm. Our model around pre-provisioning is based on learnings that we've had, you know, in every region of the world, you know, how many queries are coming in and over a period of time as you can imagine, as more and more people start using the serverless model, we learn more around how much of pre-provisioning we need to do to ensure that the response times land up being uh, acceptable to the users but you can imagine a situation where if i if i had to pick a degenerate scenario you know the capacity is full based on what's currently pre-provisioned to handle the serverless infrastructure and then uh, you came in and you know your query happened to be the one where we need to we had to go pre- pre-provision a little more mm-hmm. so you may spend a few seconds before your query gets starts getting executed but here's where you know if, if i step back and look at just within azure sql database as an example we have about 6 million active databases at any given point in time you know hundreds of billions of queries every day worldwide we're going to learn very quickly on what the optimal allocation is going to be hmm. and uh, for for the most part uh, my expectation would be that the response times while it's very hard to guarantee an sla because by sure. definition it's a serverless model right yeah. where you don't have it, have nothing pre-provisioned but there's enough volume and scale that we're going to handle that I mean unless it's a uh, very strong expectations around latency for which serverless is not the right model to begin with mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. if there's intermittent data intermittent workloads I actually think it's going to be fantastic for them Yeah yeah I mean that's the an easy selling point to me the those jobs that kick off at midnight and do whatever you they do it. yeah it's it. perfect It's perfect for those where you're like you're not too worried about you know if it's supposed to run an hour and it takes another 15 seconds I mean yeah. it's not going to matter yeah So to hear that we're adding hyperscale not just on let's say SQL Server but simultaneously on Azure SQL on Postgres and on MySQL is kind of surprising to me as a user. I've never been a database developer but I am quite certain those are three very different code bases. Yeah, absolutely and and uh, just to be clear, you know, we use hyperscale as uh, it's in in some sense it's a it's a term that we use to sort of convey hey, you know, if 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 you have a database that actually supports hyperscale 
then you know the the volume of data that it can handle the performance and scale characteristics are very very different mm-hmm. the underlying implementation you're totally spot on right like what we did with let's say sql database was around scaling out at the storage layer and at the compute layer you can scale out the read only workloads whereas with postgres if you take a look at what citus data the team built essentially was scaling out completely the relational database at the compute layer the underlying implementations are very very different and for mysql while you know we're we're actively working on it we don't have a preview that customers can go and use today mm-hmm. you know we'll be working out the details on when we're going to release it but our intention essentially is across all these three you should be able to run your applications at very very high scale and and performance expectations because a, a lot of our enterprise customers already do that. Mm-hmm. Now they spend a lot of money building out like fancy very expensive networks and you know machines and a lot of human uh, resources going sure. to making that happen and we're effectively trying to make all that be done by software and and stuff in the cloud. That's the stuff that we're working on but yeah I think you know your your observation is spot on. The implementations are very different now. You know between you know what we're doing with SQL and MySQL do we see a bunch of similarities that we can use there? and to the extent possible you know the underlying implementation of like how we did scaled out storage but there will be unique things uh in every every database engine yes the pitch you know that we're going to offer you hyperscale i mean it's the easiest sales pitch there is like That's who wouldn't right. want this yeah. and i would love for you to take on all those problems of how do i make it scale but in the back of my mind are are things like the cap theorem and acid compliance mm-hmm. and i know there has to be some sort of compromise right um, how does that compromise get managed and what opportunities do I have to configure it to some degree if I want to? Yeah, no, I think it's, it's a good question. I think, you know, there is an element of what we did again, if I go back to the SQL database implementation of Hyperscale, it essentially scales out the storage piece. So think about your updates still go to a single node. Now you can scale out the compute for a lot of your read only workloads. So you can imagine the data inside that's backing the database is shared across multiple compute nodes. it just so happens that all your updates go to a single one mm, right mm-hmm. so that way you basically the compatibility is not broken because you know you're running your read only workloads based on the consistency level that you want to support and that works great now in the citus case you know they've it, it's an interesting design point that they've chosen where they've taken the extensibility model of postgres to actually implement compute scale out what that means is you should be able to connect you know your updates can come on to any node this is the interesting question where you know you obviously like you rightly pointed out this physics what the underlying sharding algorithm tries to do is it tries to keep the data that you know if a single transaction sort of lands up you know touching a bunch of uh, data sets it tries to keep them locally on a node so even though there is a you know you're you're leveraging multiple compute engines you know or compute nodes to shard out the data if your updates are all happening on a single node in a transaction then your locality is maintained now in the degenerate case where a transaction has to span multiple nodes you're right i mean the latency is not going to be I mean, it's physics at that point, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And, uh, but this is where I think there is some maybe intelligence, if you will, as the initially as the developers are you know designing their workload to look at the partition key uh, based on you know think a little bit ahead. But they can always reorganize. You know, there's there's an element of you know uh, online reorganization that happens. But but you're right. I mean, this is not going to be a transaction running across fifty thousand nodes and you know getting you the same. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just physics at that point. Yeah. Scalability of compute has a big appeal for obvious reasons, but I'm older in my career now. I'm in more of a manager role and thinking about when I was a younger, not quite as good query writer, and uh, trying to be very clever all the time with my queries. And right. every so often, I'd write something and say, "Well, is this going to run for a while because it just needs to compute, or is this going to run for weeks and never finish?" And I don't yet know how to read the query optimizer right, and do right, these right. sorts of things. I guess I was always sort of bounded by hardware and I would make some DBA angry somewhere who would intervene. Yeah. But now, you know, I'm worried about employing people like my younger self and how do I control their blast radius, yeah. I guess. <laughs> you know, I mean that is it's 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 interesting like in in the cloud I do think there is so much more telemetry information that's available, you know, backing your queries, your workloads. If you take a look at, you know, in Azure, just the surrounding services we have, you know, things like Azure Advisor there's a lot of richness over there which gives you insights into hey am i over provisioning resources mm. mm-hmm. you know what kind of bottlenecks are my queries running into it's interesting you know it's it's you know and i think about when i was a developer and i was building it i mean the way we used to go about finding out these things was so 101 yeah <laughs> yeah you know, yeah. there's so rudimentary in terms of tool support whereas it's night and day right now if you take a look at you know just the features that are available so while i think your concerns you know obviously valid people need to get trained on this thing but 
what I can tell you is there's just the little bit of effort of trying to understand all the data that's available for you to analyze. Your developer should be able to manage it well. I'm also excited by some of the opportunities for Spark integration you'd mentioned. Right. Can you tell me a little bit under the hood how that interacts? I mean, I love Spark because in best case scenarios, I just write an actual SQL statement and I don't have to know any more Spark. That's right. But I'm aware that underneath is Catalyst and all these nice technologies. Um, how does that mesh with Cosmos DB? Cosmos DB you know, has this distributed storage layer. It's, it's, it's scaled out across, you know, could potentially go across... 10, several hundred nodes and can get into very, very large volumes of data. We, you know, we typically see like, you know, hundreds of terabytes to even, you know, multiple petabytes. So the, what the team essentially did was it took Apache Spark, so all the benefits of Spark that comes in. And the uh, essential idea was, how do you run Spark in a distributed environment? How do you govern the compute that you're given to Spark so, you know, it doesn't take away from, you know, the compute that's needed for serving other queries that, mm-hmm. you know, are coming on, on that specific node as an example. So there was a lot of uh, effort and value in building out that solid compute layer, which essentially hosts the Spark engine. It's, again, very similar to if you look at, you know, how Cassandra API gets supported or mm-hmm. how the Mongo API gets supported. I mean, underneath the covers, we are trying to move to this unified compute engine uh, that essentially handles distributed data and then, then being able to issue queries and that. So all the benefits for, of Spark in terms of, you know, them leveraging memory well, et cetera, complements because now you're running very, very close to where the actual data is. So it sort of lands up working very beautifully. And uh, I thought it'd be neat to touch on the data flows as well. This yeah. being an audio podcast, it's the least appreciable feature yeah. <laughs> of what we've talked about. But um, I'm curious how you vision that fitting into the journey for a lot of companies. Obviously, you don't get a PhD data science person and put them in front of that tool. You get someone maybe who has an MBA, and they can now have access to machine learning, and that's great. Right. Um, no, I mean, you know, the the audience that we were thinking was more of the data engineers. Data engineers. Right. So, you know, these, these are the uh, engineers who are essentially building out these big data pipelines. So they are the ones, you know, when you think about, okay, I need to I have data on-premises in certain, you know, systems, mainframes, even CRM systems, ERP systems. There's data coming out of machines and IoT devices, mm-hmm. maybe, you know, uh, from some private cloud. And then, you know, how do you ingest that data at scale, you know, land it inside some sort of a data lake uh, that allows you to manage this data at a very, very cost-effective rate. And then there are these compute engines like, you know, Spark, et cetera, that are used to sort of prepare the data. And then eventually you either serve it through a warehouse using a tool like Power BI, or you maybe, you know, serve a website by, you know, through something like a Cosmos TV as an example. So these are very standard patterns that are mm-hmm. coming together. To do all that stitching today requires a lot of code. Right. Well, ADF goes really far. I mean, it, it's already taken a lot of pain out of setting up these pipelines, but it's you know, there's still the data engineer has to write scripts, code, etc., to mm-hmm. make that work. With data flows, that's the barrier that we've removed. Mm-hmm. So you don't mm-hmm. have you know, as a data engineer, you're, you're thinking in terms of what you're trying to accomplish, not the code you really need to write to accomplish that. Right. And it's interesting if you take a look at, you know, some of this is our experience with SQL Server and SSIS and, and the ETL, ELT process, right? We supported a lot of that. Mm-hmm. Our customers are coming to expect that from Microsoft and Azure. Like, you know, this is based, you know, at the end of the day, you know, uh, I always sort of go back and tie this back to our mission, you know, to empower every human and every uh, organization on this planet to achieve more. And the manifestation of that is we are a tooling company at heart. Right. I mean, in, in a tooling comes in, you know, there's very underneath the simple tooling interface that you see, there's a lot of complication yeah. piece of platform technology that gets built up. But for us, it's about really making that super simple for the user. Right. So you shouldn't be aware of a lot of the complexity. There's enough that's already happening with this transformation. And frankly, if you look across all the clouds, there is no solution that even comes close. Right. I mean, yeah, you can buy expensive tools from, you know, other companies mm-hmm. that essentially then are not very deeply integrated. But I do think what we've done with data flows is very, very unique and differentiated. Uh, I guess in terms of implementation details, how does one get started with something like that? It's, it's just a part of, you know, the, the ADF service. Mm-hmm. So as you basically, you know, uh, you go start using Azure Data Factory, you know, one of the things is, is now the u- user experience that's built into the ADF service. So if you go to the portal, the experience is already built in. So you can basically start, you know, create a pipeline and, you know, go from there. To wind up, let's uh, touch a little bit on Edge, which seems to be a growing topic. Right. I'm reminded a little bit of when Spark Streaming came out. Yeah. Uh, one of the big cool announcements about it was like, oh, it's the exact same API. It's kind of like a one-line code change to 
switch from uh, standard Spark to streaming Spark. And it seems like there's a promise of that at the database layer right. that I can forget about these details. Where are we on that journey as a developer? That point that you just mentioned, which is, look, when I'm building my application, if the developers have to start worrying about does this run on the edge, does this mm -hmm. run in a private cloud, does it run in the public cloud, you've made their lives very complicated mm -hmm. because they don't know. Look, in a lot of these cases, these applications are distributed. The same code may have to run on the edge and it may have to run on the public cloud, right? I mean, yeah. it, it's just the nature of how these intelligent edge, intelligent cloud applications are going to be built in the future. A couple of years ago, we started thinking, you know, Satya... Uh, a couple of years ago, I built basically, you know, announced our point of view on what the modern application paradigm with intelligent cloud and intelligent edge looks like. You know, as we started thinking through that, we said, look, the consistency of the application model, application development is going to be key for our developers to be really successful. And then, you know, at that time, you look at something like a core SQL server engine and you're like, man, this is just, it's a serv it was designed for server class hardware and, you know, it sort yeah. of runs, you know, on, uh, on, on Intel and when you start thinking about ARM chips and maybe a <laughs> few hundred megabytes of memory, it's, yeah. a, it's a whole different ballgame. A lot of the effort was how do you get to work in that footprint without compromising on the surface area, right? Now, obviously, like, you know, your certain queries, you're not expecting very, very large data volumes, right, on these edge devices. Mm -hmm. So it all works out well if you linearly are able to scale down your resource usage because you're not dealing with very large volumes of data while maintaining. So that was the constraint we went with. We said, look, Consistency of the application model is paramount. I mean, we have to get that right. And that's the part, frankly, I feel the most proud of as an engineer that we were able to accomplish that. Like internally, we've seen like resources on ARM CPUs, you know, like ARM processors pegged at 100% in our test labs. I mean, which is a big deal yeah. uh, for being you know, able to push the workloads. And, and, and that was, I think, a very proud moment for the team. And, you know, of course, it's not just the application model, right? I mean, it's the same engine. So security, when you think about mm -hmm. all the features or the fact that we have now uh, extensibility that allows you to run R and Python code. So when we talk about AI built in, yeah, yeah. that runs on the edge devices, all the manageability. So using tools, you know, like SQL Server Management Studio, Azure Data Studio, that's your single pane of glass of managing edge devices, especially as it relates to uh, the SQL engine itself, uh, private clouds, other clouds, Azure. And it's, it's, it just lands up being, I think, a very consistent story for the developers. There's a nice promise there for a data scientist who's you know, independent, not part of a big company, I think, that if they want to do something with autonomous vehicles or robotics, if they can put their R on Python code, That's right. and it's already in the SQL engine. Yeah. But I imagine you don't deploy that if it's not necessary. Do I have to worry about what gets packaged in? No, I mean, it's all up to you, right? I mean, so the features and the capabilities are there. You know, which ones you turn on, which ones you use is, you know, completely up to you. Though, from based on, like, uh, the experience that, you know, we've had working with, you know, several developers through this journey, uh, that capability is very important for them, right? They, mm -hmm. they basically, like I said, they want to... They want the ability, like a DevOps ability, to be able to sort of run experiments, train the model in the cloud, use all the elasticity and you know computing power. And then once they get to a certain point where they believe, okay, now we have the model that's right, how do I deploy that at scale on these edge devices? And and I think that's the part where you know being able to support that SQL engine on this ARM device that essentially can reserve a certain amount of compute power to run the inference is a pretty big deal. Well, the closeout, we're talking about a lot of technology that's kind of in motion, if you will. Yeah. What are you most excited about five years out? You know, there's this bunch of, you know, things, of course, that we, you know, always, if you take a look at uh, just the way we plan out investments on our team sides, there are these, you know, you know, what we call Horizon 1, Horizon 2, Horizon 3 projects, which, uh, you know, Horizon 1 is, hey, what's sort of coming up in the next maybe like 8 to 12 months? Horizon 2 is more like the, you know, the three-year time frame. And then Horizon 3 is like some of these moonshots. Mm -hmm. We're really trying to look at, based on having our discussions with customers and what kind of challenges they're trying to solve for hardware trends. You know, there's, we, we constantly follow that and uh, looking at what will be the expectation as people start pushing the boundaries of machine, machine learning and AI. How does that sort of gel with the vertical problems as in like, you know, so think about hey, for the gaming industry, for the healthcare industry, for the financial services industry, for the retail industry. Uh, you know, what are the things that we could do above and beyond just, you know, uh, being a platform? That would be an example of like a Horizon 2 project, yeah. an example that we're thinking through. But yeah, a lot, lot of it, you know, we work very closely with the Microsoft research team. And uh, and uh, I mean, some of these are too early to share, frankly. But, sure, sure. Uh, but, but you can imagine there's just some really, really out there stuff. <laughs> awesome. Well, I'm excited to see all that come to fruition. Yeah. Thanks again for taking the time to chat with me. 